Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we are pleased uh, to have uh, Daniel Felinto, a speaker of the seminar series of the Brazilian Physical Society in the area of atomic and molecular physics. Daniel uh, Felinto received uh, his bachelor's degree in physics from uh, UFP in 1996. His master and PhDs, uh, again from the same university, uh, respectively in 1998 and uh, 2002. He also made two postdocs, uh, one at USP in 2003 and another one at Caltech uh, between 2004 and 2006. Uh, Daniel is currently an associate professor at the UFP. He works in the field of uh, quantum physics with an emphasis on optics, atomic physics, and quantum information. And he's also a CMPQ uh, researcher 1D. His specialty is in light matter interactions so to develop new types of atomic memories for quantum networks, entangled processes, and quantum computation with the atomic ensembles. He's an associate editor of Physical Review A, and he's a referee for several high-impact scientific journals. He published more than 55 scientific papers with more than 3,000 citations. The title of today's colloquium is uh, Exploring the Coherent Nature of uh, Spontaneous Emission. Uh, YouTube attendees uh, can interact with the speaker by asking questions via chat that will be read by the committee members. Please, Daniel, you can start. Okay. Thank you, Tommaso. I mean, it, it's a great pleasure to be here today and I mean, present our, our work to a broad audience. And I hope uh, you'll be interested and make some questions in the end. So what, what I'm going to discuss today is uh, a problem that I've been working the last uh, 15 years. Né? And I have to warn that I'm going to start with a little bit of a digression. But I learned with time that's the best way to present what I do for a more general physical audience. Né? So, uh, I have to start uh, remind or calling attention what we call a scientific paradigm, né? which is basically a set of, this set of concepts and practice that defines a scientific discipline like physics at a particular period of time. What I mean by that is that it's not just the, the theory and the experimental methods, but uh, this idea of scientific paradigm also comprises our beliefs of where we should apply this, the theories. Okay, so it's belief, uh, uh, it's the belief of how we can expand or what set of phenomena is explained by the theory. And nowadays, I mean, quantum mechanics provides our most fundamental theories for the universe. And this is based first in the enormous success on experimental tests, but also in various technological revolutions that started from quantum mechanics. So it has the whole arc of, uh, I mean, of uh, explaining natural phenomena and then devising applications and then changing our world, our, our world from that. However, there is a, a problem. There is the, the description of the world by quantum mechanics, there is commonly some conflicts with our perception of reality. And this leads to some, some uh, tension between something that's called the quantum world and a classical world. And this, I mean, entailed a long discussion on this on transition or the boundary between quantum and classical de descriptions, or what we call the emergence of the classical world. As a consequence, in my view, I mean, this leads a little bit to, uh, for us to hold back uh, broader applications of quantum mechanics, uh, as if it was necessary only for certain domains. This, this problem will become clear throughout the seminar, but it, it's important to have in mind. And my personal view, at least, is that the, the problem is not at all our macroscopic perception of reality, but it's, it's simply the complex of quantum mechanics. Okay. And the problem is another fundamental physical, uh, not fundamental scientific principle, which is uh, Occam's razor, né? which is the simplicity principle, né? which basically broadly states that when you have two competing theories that make exactly the same prediction, uh, the simpler one is the best. 
And the problem is that quantum theory is complex, okay? And for individual experiments, a full quantum mechanical treatment is commonly not the simplest theory. That quantum mechanics actually becomes forceful, I mean, becomes the simplest theory when considering larger sets of different experiments. But there is a conflict between apply a, the complex theory of our global scientific paradigm or this Occam's razor for particular experiments. And the goal, I mean, in this talk is actually to offer a glimpse of what's left out when we choose not to apply the full quantum theory. And along the lines, on this, I, I will explain also the work that, that we are doing present in the Quantum Networks Laboratory at UFP. So, what do you call what I call global quantum system? First, we, we need to start with our usual quantum mechanical treatment that we learn in our undergraduate course and graduate course as well. We always start with an isolated quantum system. It's somehow a, a quantum system that you you were able to uh, uh, well isolate from the environment. And you describe this system using the wave functions from our quantum mechanics course. But later on, on our research career, we learned that there is a more realistic approach, which is to consider an open quantum system. It's to consider then this, this your quantum system in connection with some, with the external world that I call here the reservoir. And you, typically don't know everything about your external world. And this leads to uncertainties in your physical description. And this leads to a description of the system as a statistical mixture uh, defined by this density matrix for the state. And also for the dynamics of the system, instead of being uh, determined by Schrodinger equation, to be determined by some master equation derived from Schrodinger equation plus some statistical mechanical considerations. However, according to our paradigm of quantum theory being the most fundamental theory, we should have an even more real, more realistic approach, which would be to quantize everything. I mean, to deal with our quantum system in connection with a quantum world. And the interesting is that when you do that, then you go back to your Schrodinger equation and you go back to your wave function. But the challenge in doing that is that you actually start to, to deal with intrinsically multipartite systems. And that I think is, is a crucial point that we developed in the last decades in the field of quantum information, is how to deal with this, this uh, partially distributed quantum systems that are correlated and you need to do measurement in different parts of it. So this is the big difference. When you are talking about an open quantum system, you are talking about addressing an individual system in contact to another that you don't do anything with that. But when you are talking about this kind, this description that I call global quantum system, you need to address all interacting systems to have a full information about what's going on. And now I, I, to exemplify this problem, now from now on, I will concentrate on the problem of spontaneous emission. First, you, we have to remind that spontaneous emission is just a completely ubiquitous phenomenon. It's, it's the light that we see, okay? That's basically what we results from this spontaneous emission. But the, the first, more the more formal description of it came from the beginning of quantum mechanics huh? with the Bohr atom in 1913 when Bohr described the process of quantum jumps and, and then he described that an atom in an excited state when when de-excited it would transit transit to the ground state doing a jump of uh, unknown origin <laughs> and in the process the atom could emit a photon of light, and it could emit light. And at the time, it's important to have in mind that the name itself, spontaneous emission, is related to the unknown origin of the emission. 
Okay, so it's spontaneous if it has no cause. That was the idea. An interesting observation came already in 1917 by Einstein when he observed that the, the notion of a photon with uh, quantized energy and momentum actually <laughs> implies that if an atom spontaneously emits a photon, it must suffer a recoil uh, of its movement, in its movement. And, but this is a direct consequence just of the quantization of energy in the photon. So the spontaneous emission, the debate about spontaneous emission continued slowly. And I, the first formulation, full formulation of the problem of, of a complete model was done by Dirac in 1927 through the development of quantum electrodynamics, which provide the first theory né, for the rate of decay rate of due to spontaneous emission from an atom. Né? And it and then Dirac explained this effect as interaction with vacuum modes. So actually, what we call spontaneous emissions should be called vacuum-induced emissions. If you look for its more, more fundamental modeling. But the theory that we, we now this consider the uh, most widespread theory used for spontaneous emission was actually due by to Vascov and Wigner in the 1930s. And what, what's the problem that's considered in the vascov Wigner theory? I mean, they, they consider actually an, an atom in the excited state and in interaction with a quantum vacuum. This quantum vacuum is actually just a broadband bath of plane waves coming from all directions and at a ground state energy. And in this theory, they show that through the coherent interaction of the atoms with the vacuum modes, you have an irreversible exponential decay at the experimental observed rate. So you can, can have really quantitative uh, predictions from this model, it's very successful. However, for our discussion here, it's important to have in mind that typically this process is, I mean, is recalled as an explanation for why we, we observe rate equations in the decay. It's like a fundamental explanation for observing irreversible decays uh, that can be well approximated by rate equations. And we should, we should be careful about this picture, okay? Because this is not the whole story. When we have an atom, when the atom decays to the ground state, if we do a full quantum mechanical treatment of it, we actually don't have a, a simple ground state because the atom can emit a photon in a particular direction and then it will, the atom will suffer recoil to the other direction. But you don't know which direction the atom will emit. So you, you actually have a superposition uh, of states Okay, which is actually nowadays we understand this as being a highly entangled state between atom and light. And this illustrates uh, a fundamental issue, issue with, uh, when you apply quantum mechanics is that you have a lot of complexity at the bottom. Okay. But we see that this complex has consequence, has consequence and this interesting consequence that we can explore. But the notion of entangled state, I mean, it was not present at the time Vascov Wigner uh, theory was developed. It, actually, the, the, the notion of entangled state came later, around five years later, in, a, in, a, in an article by Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen, when they basically uh, show that the superposition states involve distant particles would contradict some intuitive notions of locality and causality. That was a very important uh, paper, especially on our views <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> and because it uncovered a hidden, and I would say maybe unwanted consequence of quantum mechanics at the time, <laughs> which is this quantum entanglement. And I think the basic idea 
in this in these papers is this. I mean, they basically tell that tell us that don't fool us with correspondence principles. Quantum theory is deeply strange. I mean, at the time there was this discussion that as the system, the size of the system grows, it becomes more classical. And what I think Paul Dos Rose was calling attention is that you can actually have a macroscopic distance involved in your state. And the theory that we are using to describe reality will lead to strange results. Of course, they would consider that this would be an indication of the incomplete nature of quantum mechanics. But nowadays, I think we understand more and more this as the incomplete nature of our classical notions of reality. But I think it, there is an important, really important point here is that they call it, this is a very basic, uh, a very basic process in quantum mechanics. And we shouldn't expect such a basic process to have no consequence. Because you, you need to understand that a really good portion of, phys, of the physicist community really think that quantum entanglement is somehow restricted to certain domain or is fragile. But I don't think we can understand in that way at all, because it's really, really uh, just the way quantum mechanics describes reality. It's really hard to believe that it has small consequence. It should have really large consequence. And I think this, this paper try, try to really convey this idea that it is a fundamental problem, problem or characteristic. So it took actually the, the proposition by Einstein Podos Rosen was interesting, but was not actually uh, address, uh, addressable in an experimental setting. It took 30 years for John Bell to come up with a way to really test this, this notion of quantum entanglement and this strange aspect of quantum mechanics. And he did that by actually mapping the problem of locality and causality in the original paper with the idea that this should entail the independence of results for of not the independence of results, the independence of the results in very for very dis, uh, distant measurements with the, your option of measurement I mean, with your uh, measurement setup so your your measurement setup in one position shouldn't affect the measurement in the other position that was a very clever way to put the problem because it's completely outside quantum mechanics. It's just related with causality. But it was very successful to really pinpoint um, the, where quantum entanglement can be found and how to witness quantum entanglement. Uh, it's important to have in mind from now on the seminar, I will discuss actually a particular version of this bell inequalities, this Bell measurement, which was adapted for polarization states of light. It was adapted by this work by Clauser, Horn, Shimon, and Holt. So it's called CHSH inequality. And I'm going to discuss a lot of these measurements uh, with polarization states. But the idea is that you can, you can, uh, you can obtain, you can measure in your experiment what is, what's called Bell parameter, which should be smaller or equal than two if your measurements were really independent with your, with, from the measurement setups. And the problem is that quantum mechanics allows this S parameter to be larger than two. And this would indicate then this violation of this locality and causality notion and the validity of quantum mechanics with, together with the notion of quantum entanglement. There are different observations of quantum entanglement between light and matter. I like this particular one from the group of Chris Monroe in the United States, because it directly shows this polarization correlation between a single ion and a single photon. Okay? Obviously, to, to have correlations in polarization, 
you need to have some internal structure in the atom. And the authors do that by using the Zeeman structure of the atom, which connected with the, of the ground state, we've connected with the Zeeman structure of the excited state in a way that you can, you can have different transitions depending on the polarization of the field. So the internal state of the atom, the internal polarization state of the atom is actually connected with the polarization state of the emitted photon when you decay from the excited state. And they use this notion in the quantization of the, of the, of the vacuum field, of course, uh, to measure actually the polarization of the emitted photon and the polarization left in the atom and violate with that the Bell inequality, measure this Bell parameter to be above two, showing in this, this entanglement. But I mean, this is, I, I just uh, call attention to this experiment. That it's, it's, it's important to actually to move now back to our original discussion on the usual way to apply quantum mechanics and moving towards a more global way of applying it. So in our usual way, I mean, when you consider light interact with atoms, you consider the, the coherent interaction of the light with these isolated atoms, and you describe this with a wave function. But then when we want to have a more realistic approach, then you introduce at least the decoherence uh, coming from spontaneous emission. When you do that, you don't have a completely coherent dynamics, and then you need to describe your system through a density matrix and through the block equation. So, which is just the master equations that just how the master equations are called in this kind of system. When you do that, you, you end up with equations like this, where you have a coherent dynamics part and an incoherent dynamics portion of the, of the equation. The coherent dynamics is completely equivalent to the Schrodinger equation, but the incoherent dynamics, that's, the, that's what comes from this, your unknown decay process. But actually, if we work from, from, funda from a more fundamental level, then you have this more real, even more realistic approach, which it means, which is the atoms interact with your coherent exciting field and with the quantum vacuum. And then you move back to the wave function and from here, I mean, there are many phenomena that that, uh, that you start to explore when you do that, even prior to quantum information. You had, well, you have quantum electrodynamics itself, but you also have the lamp shift, the Purcell effect, and the whole capped QED system. Uh, these were effects of this quantized vacuum over different properties of the atom or of light. But we will learn that there are even more, uh, let's say, stringent ways to explore this, this, this interaction between the atoms and the quantum vacuum. Daniel? Olá, você está me ouvindo? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you I, can, I can hear you, but I'm actually Which without I light. I'm... Ah, yes. Can, oh, we, I think that the presentation is still working. The presentation is working. That's yeah. the most fundamental pro okay. <laughs> question. But I will just deactivate the sound just to give an instruction for someone. Let's wait a second. Uh, Tomazo. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 You uh, can go ahead. <laughs> could you give me a couple of minutes just to to solve this? I think I can solve very really quickly. And then everybody can see me again. 
<laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. We can, we can wait for so you. Quickly. I hope. Okay. Are you still with me? <laughs> yes, 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 Daniel. Please go ahead. We were waiting for you. Okay. Sorry for the interruption, but. <laughs> That's a reminder. Uh, so, we, what I was... we have uh, one, half an hour has already passed, so we have more or less more That's 30 great. more minutes. Okay. Oh, we, we, are, we are fine for now. So, I mean, uh, I discussed the problem of interaction of an atom with the vacuum modes, but I mean, we want to explore this kind of process from now on. And it's interesting, hence, and there are two basic ways. In this case, you typically have this single vacuum mode interacting many times. Hello, Tomazo. Yes, Daniel. Tomazo. I, yes, I can are hear you. you. you okay, I can pass here. I think it's a fine yes. now. <laughs> Let's go. And the other way is through super radiance. Okay, what's super radiance? Super radiance when you have one. So in Purcell effect, you have just cavity, which enhances the vacuum mode by confining it in space. So it's like it, it interacts with the atom many times. But in super radiance, you can have the same vacuum mode shared by a large number of atoms. And in this way, you can get a coherent coupling of the atoms through the vacuum, through the coherent interaction with the vacuum. And typically, in this case, you have an ensemble of atoms in an excited state that would decay to the ground state. But it can decay very differently if you deal with a low density of atoms, in which case you have typically a not very directional emission, and you have a decay in a time that is consistent with the time of a single atom. When you start to have a high density or a large number of atoms, then you start to have more directionality in the emission and you have faster emission from the ground state. And we are going to explore from now on more this super radiance way to enhance the interaction with, of the atoms with the vacuum. And a good place to start is through a Raman process, actually, which is 
a very common process that's explored in many different fields. Nowadays, mostly in molecular systems and solid state, but we can explore also in atomic systems. And this Raman interaction, you start from with a three level system. And for our case, for our, for our study, we are going to start pumping all atoms in the ensemble to one of the ground states. Okay. So I just, as I told you, Raman processes are really well known and explored in many different ways, but how to explore it for to use this correlation with the vacuum modes, that's pretty recent. That comes from 2001, 2003, okay? And, and what we can do? We can start by exciting the, the sample with a right field detuned from the excited state. And as a result, you can have the one atom, for example, emitting a photon in field one and being transferred from the state G to state S. The thing is, when you describe this at, at a fundamental level, what you have from this simple process is already an entangled state, okay? It's a state where you can have an entanglement in the number of excitations with, for example, possibly one with zero photons in field one and zero atoms transferred to S, but you can also have with some probability P one atom transferred to S with one photon muted in field one. And when we say one atom in S, actually we mean this kind of state that I'm writing in a schematic way here, which is basically called uh, this symmetric collective state in which we have one atom transferred to S, but you don't know which one. So this is a macroscopic superposition of different states in which one atom was transferred, but you have a superposition of the possibilities of which atom was transferred. And you can have two atoms actually being transferred to a state S, and then you have a symmetric state with these two, two different uh, atoms, in, but you don't know which ones, and so on. So this is already, uh, it's a, it's a very, very straightforward, uh, entangled state. And the problem per se is not the, the entanglement itself, is, is how can we really uh, see the consequence of these entangled states? And what we need to do in order to, to see this is to actually put a detector in field one. Notice that when you do that and you get a click, what you are actually doing is a projective measurement in the entangled state, which leaves the atomic system in a single excitation state. The single excitation state is actually a highly non-classical state okay, because you can actually approximate this to a Fox state in this degree of freedom, this mode of excitation, in the limit of, of probability of excitation is very small. So this kind of simple uh, uh, action is actually what we should pay attention as being the measurement on the quantum reservoir. So now I'm doing a measurement in the reservoir in the vacuum moles that were actually the reason for the atom to spontaneously emit. When I do that, then I gain a lot of information on the atomic system. So how can I use this information? I can actually map this atomic state in a second photon. I can come for a read field and I can transfer the atom back to the state G, emitting a photon in the process. And the first process was spontaneous emission. The second process is not because the spontaneous emissions that occur in the right process, it actually created a coherence between the atoms in the ensembles. And when you read, then you have this super radiant emission caused by this collective states that start in the system. And that's how you can generate then a, a Fox state right, with a large suppression of the other higher order component. Just to, we can, just to connect with the Bell inequalities that I, I mentioned, you can actually do the same process using the Zeeman states in the, in the hyperfine levels. 
And with that, you can, you can have this write and reading process uh, encoding polarization in both of them. And you can actually violate Bell inequalities between the two photons emitted, one in the write process and one in the read process. So this was done in these articles at, uh, from Kimball's group in Caltech. And then we can measure here the, the Bell inequality that is be, uh, above two for uh, uh, not so short storage time of around 20 microseconds. There's a time that we can store the information, this collective state in the atomic ensemble. So now uh, going to back to Recife, <laughs> when we start uh, our, the, this line of research there, we actually started characterize the role of super radiance in this process that are in the process that I just described. The previous work actually used the, the super radius, but they were not focused on the role of the super radius in the process. That's what that was the first uh, series of measurements that we did. And in order to do that, first, uh, we need to prepare the system in a situation where you, you have uh, a considerable suppression of the two photon components for the second photon. And so uh, if we have a, a, this G2, conditional G2, which, which is the normalized second order correlation function for the second photon, when we have that below half, we can generally talk that this is entering the single photon regime. And then we prepare this single photon and we actually show that the, the wave pack of the emitted photon had some oscillations over time. And this oscillatory, this oscillatory behavior changes with the number of atoms. And we actually deduce an analytical expression that describes the emitted photon as a combination of rabbit oscillations and, and enhanced decay. I mean, we don't have more, the, the gamma is the decay rate for a single atom, but is enhanced by this parameter key. Yeah? And this enhancement is proportional to the number of atoms. And then we show experimentally that it follows as, as it should. Basically what we showed here is that you have this accelerate decay instead of, of having six nanoseconds for a single atom, we observe 16 nanoseconds for the ensemble. And this basically uh, represents one, of, one fundamental aspect is, of the problem is that you have the single photon that's emitted collectively. I think that's the interesting notion in this kind of problem. We actually went beyond this point and we explored uh, a, fox state, a larger fox state. We explored two photon, this, this problem at the two photon level which we think it was quite interesting to have this two photon super radiance because this is not anymore in, uh, a limit for, for example, an attenuated laser. If you, if you have an attenuated laser, you have the, the largest component to be at a, below a certain point, this single photon component, but, but now you have very, very weak light, but with a two photon component being more prominent. And I'm not entering details here, but basically we also measure this temporal wave pack of these two photons. And now we prepare these two photon states. So far, what we have, <laughs> we have that light spontaneously emitted, it's quantum entanglement to its source, okay? Or quantum entanglement, basically you should understand as being as ubiquitous as fluorescence. And the problem is, What's the consequence of that? What, what it means? <laughs> we can have some ideas of the consequence from another experiment, also from the Caltech group of Jeff Kimball when I was working there in my postdoc. And in this, in this kind of experiment, you start with two of those Raman process, which as I told you are very common process in nature, but you start with two of them and when you detect this, that photon in field one, you actually combine before the detection, the field one from two different ensembles in such a way that when you detect this photon, you don't know from which ensemble it came from. 
And by just doing that, you end up entangling the two ensembles. This is the kind of process that is strange to understand if you don't consider the entanglement between atom and photon. Because then they shouldn't be, the, the, what's left in the ensemble shouldn't be connected with the detection. But if you remember that you should consider the emitted photon as a quantum entanglement to the ensemble, then it's natural that you are doing some kind of swapping of entanglement here. Uh, hello, Tommaso, are you with me? Yes. Yeah, OK, OK, yes, because uh, I know some, <laughs> it stopped a little bit. OK, let's go. And yeah. so and then we, we did this experiment in 2005, and we showed that actually we observed this entanglement. It's kind of, um, there are, of course, trick considerations. I mean, we have, in order to observe and characterize the entanglement, we have to control really well the phase, the optical phase in the pathways of this, both the excitation fields and the emitted light from the two ensembles. That's the phase is at a one here. We should control it really well. And the state itself was strange in the sense that there was just one excitation. I mean, we have one excitation, one ensemble, and zero in the other, or vice versa. Vice versa. That was the, the, the entangled state. But actually, we could characterize it in the reading process when we extract the field two from the two ensembles, we could do a tomography of this, of this system, of the, of the two optical modes coming out of the ensemble. And we can get the density matrix for the whole system. And from that, we can extract the concurrence, which is a tangling quantifier. So now we are moved to another notion of quantum information that started with Bell inequalities as a witness of quantum entanglement, but evolved over time to develop quantifiers for quantum entanglement, quantifiers for the possible capability of that state for to perform tasks in quantum information. And concurrency is one of these used quantifiers. And now in, you see that uh, we are right, talking about theory in the 1998. And then we, we showed basically that this concurrence is above zero and showed the entanglement between the two ensembles. This is a subtle entanglement, but it's there and you can use it actually. And then two, two years later, we used two pairs of these ensembles with this, exactly the same states. And with two pairs, we could actually, uh, actually map this information in polarization states and we could violate bell inequalities between two magnetic optical traps distant in space with two ensembles exciting each of them. And, and then with this violation of the bell inequality, we showed not only entanglement between these distant sites, but also polarization entanglement, which is known to, to, to be useful for, for example, for quantum cryptography. So actually, these two processes were just part of uh, a long distance quantum communication protocol that was proposed in 2001, which is called the DLCZ protocol, due to the authors that uh, dual looking, Sirak Zoller and Zoller. And this was really a very important, I think, development, which is basically a theoretical development, not an experimental one, of course, because they basically introduced this, the notion that, okay, you have this coherent interaction of the vacuum with the atomic system, and you can explore it to do long distance quantum communication. And they showed how to do that with very simple system, which is the ensemble of atoms. That's the process that I just described to you. The, the process behind, besides this, the two elements that I just showed you, it's, it's important to the process, the notion of entanglement swapping, in which you can actually start with entangled systems and you do measurements in parts of them and then you, you project what's left in through longer and longer distance. That's what, how the long distance came in the title. But they showed that you can do teleportation, this kind of process, you can do cryptography. This, they work with foreign some that I described is the part of the cryptography for, the, for this protocol. So, uh, what I think is very interesting, this quantum information, when you look at this basic 
problem is that in a certain way, I mean, it's hard to understand what's the role of quantum entanglement in our macroscopic world, because we live in a dense world, actually. <laughs> and But actually, quantum information provides a way to do an engineering of artificial phenomena to explore quantum entanglement. I think that's really, it's, it's a, has a large impact in physics in general. But you can ask, is there a larger role in natural phenomena? of this quantum entanglement. Besides, I mean, not only in, the, in our engineered uh, phenomena, but in, in, in natural phenomena in general. And we have some hints of it. What, what we lose, what, what we lose when you interpret the natural phenomena without entanglement. Well, from quantum information, we, we have, we know, for example, that quantum mechanics allows much more information to be stored on the correlation between between distinct systems than on the isolated systems themselves, which means that a measurement on two distinct systems may, may result in, in, in random uh, outputs in each of them, but these random outputs may occur concurrently in both systems, okay? Or saying another way, it's possible to have zero information on individual systems and a lot of information on the correlation. What basically means that quantum entanglement is, is really a, a powerful physical resource. And I, in my view, at least, it's quite strange that nature didn't find a, a, a way to use it, basically. And the other thing that's interesting is that the amount of information that can be stored in correlation go, grows really fast with the number of interactive systems. I mean, when the size of the system increases, it grows really fast which basically means that we have more complexity. <laughs> so we got back to the problem of complexity to understand the consequence of quantum entanglement in nature. But I would like then to, to move a little bit to, okay, our approach here in Recife. I already showed some of the results related to super radiance, but actually we have a, a laboratory that is called Quantum Networks Laboratory because this is actually a field where we can explore this idea, both in terms of technological applications in creating these artificial phenomena to explore quantum entanglement, but actually as a platform also to see how the, this, this phenomena increase as we, you control the increase the size of the system, try to get more intuition about how you can find this kind of phenomena in nature. So for technological applications, I mean, I already call attention to the problem of quantum communication. The, the GLCZ protocols allows you to distribute entanglement through long distance. And if you can do polarization entanglement, then you can do cryptography, and that's a, already an interesting task. But actually, there is a more general notion that was uh, really highlighted by this article by Jeff Kimball in 2008 of this quantum internet, uh, which is a, basically a connection of different physical systems sharing uh, entanglement, and that's able to do a lot of tasks. It's able to do quantum communication, distributed computation, and, and actually there are many different applications for this kind of systems, like synchronizable single photo source, synchronizable source of more complex quantum states, you can do quantum metrology, and you can do long distance communication. That's what I call attention to. This whole field actually received a boost recently in 2017 with this work by, by the Chinese group of Jinwei Pan, in which they, they demonstrate the, the first successful quantum communication satellite. And they were able to really distribute quantum entanglement over 1,200 kilometers. And basically they show a nerve scale quantum network. And this, I think this is really energized the, the field in terms of technological applications of, of this approach. But we have also basic science uh, interests, as I, as I mentioned already. Then we want to understand, for example, the role uh, and characterization of quantum entanglement in as the size of this composite system grows, and we want to explore new processes come from this full quantum mechanical treatment 
of a physical system, both in terms of new quantum members and new states of light. And we want to, of course, also investigate these non-trivial quantum aspects of natural phenomena. I think these are all problems in the frontier on how we can understand the role of quantum entanglement. And in our case, in particular, through this process of spontaneous emission in more and more complex conditions. Uh, a first example of this approach is, is a, a paper that we published really this year, which is treats a linear scatter from two level atoms. This is a very well known problem. You can find it in many textbooks of quantum optics. But when you do that in a very controllable way, it gets really interesting. So, at least in our view, <laughs> first, we can prepare. Now we, we are going, we're moving to an even simpler system. I mean, I just an ensemble of atoms that we can describe as having two internal levels only. And we can prepare that in, in rubidium atoms by just exciting with a circular polarized light. And then you can optically pump to a cycling transition. And what we do is that we excite in this, in a particular direction, this red line here, and we detect light emitted with a small angle around three degrees from the excitation. And then we analyze with a pair of detectors in, in a scheme called Humbury Brown Twist interferometer, which allows us to measure the normalized two photon correlation function directly. And then we can see we see what's expected from the from the model, from classical models, that we should have in zero, this autocorrelation function should be the two, according to a like a thermostate. And as time passed by, it should go to one. The focus of our work was actually the fact that you have this long coherence time of microseconds that we connected to the temperature of the sample. And also there is a the dynamics in this, between these curves, how do you change the parameters? But we also had a, a, a different interest, which was, is connected with what I've been discussing, which is to formulate a quantum model for this class, for this well-known uh, classical or semi-classical result. The quantum theory, actually, if we describe at a, at a fundamental level this process, what we have is actually a, after the first detection, I mean, we, the second order correlation function is a, is, a correl, is a function that gives the correlation between two detections, okay, in the field. And then we have a first detection, and then we have the system right after, uh, we have the second detection a little bit later. But after the first detection, actually what we have is a macroscopic entangled state, okay, in the momentum, in space. It means that we have an atom that received a kick from the photon. It absorbed the photon in one direction and re-emitted in the other. But we don't know which atom did that. And then you end up with this kind of entangled state. And but this dephase over time, okay, and this dephase of these collective states eventually lead to the decay of this correlation function. And with that, we can obtain this correlation function as being one plus this other term, this exponential of minus this separation between the two detections and the Doppler decay time. This is what's expected from a thermal light source, which is two at tau equals zero and one when tau gets really large. But this is the same result as you get from the classical model. I mean, if you forget about your quantized atom or your quantized momentum of light, and you consider that you have a source with an elect a total electric field that's composed of the sum of electric field from different emitters that has the same frequency, but an uncorrelated phase. And then you can calculate this second order correlation function, and you see that it depends on the phase change of each atom independently. And this phase change is actually a function of the thermal movement of the atoms. And from this, you get exactly the same expression, actually with exactly the same decay constant. But I think 
for us at least, it's interesting to actually cultivate this picture of also have the full quantum explanation to see how we can explore that in a more uh, more interesting way. And we have already some results showing quantum correlations in these ensembles of two levels atoms, but not in the memory. I mean, for C, for continuous excitation. And what we do actually is just <laughs> we do a a mirror process as that we as we, of what I just described to you. Now I can I excite this system through one side and I detect with a certain angle, but also at the same time excite through the other side and detect in the opposite direction. Okay. So when I when I do this, note now that I detect two different fields. If I can detect two different fields, I can calculate a specific cauchy chivars inequality that is valid for classical fields. And for this, I need this cross correlations, which is the correlation between one of the emitted fields and the other. And I also need the auto correlations, which is the one that I just described in the last slide. I mean, if you just look in one direction and you see the correlation of the field with itself, that's what's called auto correlation. This relation between the two, these quantities should be smaller than one for classical fields or equal to one. And what we observe is this kind of curve. So we have this red curve and the green curve that's behind it. It gives a, a maximum of two at zero. And this is exactly the same result that I described in the, the previous uh, slide. But now we have this cross correlation that's larger than two. Uh, Tomás, I lost your camera also. Are you with me? Okay. I'm here, Daniel. Okay, I see you. Five more minutes, I think. No, I'm, I will start, I will finish prior okay, to Okay, great. <laughs> great, great, no problem. Okay, but then my, the, note now that the cross correlations are larger than the autocorrelations in different delays. And so I have this cauchy virus inequality that changes with the delay between the photons and I I clearly see a, a violation of it at certain regions. So we have this the R as being around two, which is considerably larger than one. And you have these non-classical correlations, even in this simple two-level system. And the interesting thing that I find here is that this is a quantum correlation that is actually resilient over really the most basic linear scattering noise. So we can observe that without any filtering. So I, I have certain linear scattering in both directions. This linear scattering is in the signal, but it's still we still have uh, a quantum correlation prevailing over this, this linear scattering, which, which basically highlights that uh, I mean, if you want, you can do a semi-classical model for this system. I mean, this is a, is a common system to develop semi-classical models. I mean, semi-classical models, I mean, a classical, classical light field with a quantum atom. But you can see already that you don't explain the whole phenomenon because you can have this, some of these simple results already showing this quantum correlation. Actually, we see this oscillation just to call attention. What we have here is actually when you have these two process, these two excitation fields, you end up in having various process superposing the ensemble. You can have this what I call elastic process with all fields, the excitation and the emitted light with the same frequency, but you can also start to have side bands, okay, given by the the central excitation field and sidebands uh, detuned uh, from the distance to the excited state. Okay? And then basically this oscillation that you see uh, in the imaging, the correlation functions comes from the, the beating between these different components. And the problem is from, a, let's say, operational point of view, quantum mechanics actually uh, works with this interference in a quite different way than this, the classical theories. That's how you, you end up with this, this violation of these classical limits. So what are our conclusions of this, of this talk?
talk. Né? I mean, I, I hope you you keep in mind that our understanding of the spontaneous emission process has evolved over time, and it still has a long way to go. Okay, we are just, I think, starting to explore really this coherent nature of spontaneous emission and all possibilities of complex entangled state that are actually just uh, continuously generated uh, around us. Uh, so I also expect that you to keep in mind that quantum information brought new tools and concepts uh, that allowed for significant development on the problem. Okay, that's really important. I mean, if you want to address this, this coherent nature in, in spontaneous emission, you need to think about multipartite systems and you need to think about uh, projective measurements and multipartite correlations. But also I, I want to present some of our first results of this of our of my of our quantum networks laboratory to FPE, which uh, comprise some measurements of this Fox state super radiance, some measurements on atomic memories uh, with two level atoms, but also some measurements of quantum correlations with the simpler two level atoms. Now, with this, I just want to highlight the, the group that uh, I mean, contribute to the experiments in Recife. I mean, I showed some, exper some uh, results from my postdoctorate at, at Caltech, but I'm focused here in the, in the group for the experiments there in Recife. And in blue, I focus the present uh, team for the Quantum Networks Laboratory, both uh, me and postdocs and PhD students and master's students. But actually, I have strong collaborations, I mean, with Professor Taboza that I include here in this, in this talk. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. And with Pablo Saldanha, they work with me in this problem, this specific problem. But also we have contribution for previous postdocs and PhD students and also master students for that. So with that, thank you <laughs> for your attention and open for questions. Thank you, thank Tomas. You, thank, you, <laughs> thank you, Daniel, for the very nice uh, and interesting talk, very clear also. I really enjoyed it and I hope that uh, our participants as well. So while we wait for questions, uh, I don't see questions yet in the, in the chat. I have two curiosities, uh, Daniel. First, okay. uh, when you were talking about the collective atomic states uh, in the first part, and uh, I guess that the, the, the idea there to create uh, these entangled states uh, by spontaneous emission uh, there is by basically um, using uh, a low intensity laser, right? You are not exploiting the interactions between the atoms because in principle you can have, if you put a very, I mean, or am I wrong? No, that depends on how you call interaction because the, the problem is that they share the, the collective state. I mean, you, you mean that super radiance part, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So when they share a vacuum mode, okay, and then you detect a photon and you don't know which atom contribute to that, uh, to that emission, in a certain way, you do have an interaction. But uh, it is, it's true that it's low power and actually it's a diluted sample, but uh, you never, sh never should forget that uh, the measurement is actually a very nonlinear process. And actually, the projective measurements are very strong uh, action that you do in the in the physical system. So it, you uh, end up having some interaction through the vacuum. Oh no, I, I completely agree. I, I had in mind a different system. For example, when you include uh, when you consider uh, Rydberg atoms, uh, in mm -hmm. which there basically you suppress all uh, oh, yeah. highly excited or doubly doubly or triply excited states or even more. Because basically you have very strong interactions, and all all uh, states with more than one intera more than one excited state uh, is basically very is dynamically unfavored, I would say. Yes. So very very oppressive. Here, this is not the case, right? No, 
No, uh, this is, these atoms are quite small. <laughs> I mean, they are close to the ground state. They are in the first excited state at most. Né? When yes. you go to the Hidberg regime, then you, you have really a much larger atom and you typically need a little bit larger density then to, to start to have this, this kind of interaction. So we are not in this regime. You can actually basically neglect the interactions of the atoms with the with the other atoms and you can get a, a good description of the experiment yes no because i think that some of the results that you were showing have also been uh, reproduced with Rydberg atoms uh, a few years later so actually, actually with Hidberg atoms you can do more than that because what happens with the ensemble is that you always have a you start with a mixture and you need to do the projective measurement to really be able to access the, the quantum nature of the process. So, but in the Hidberg atoms, since you have this uh, blockade effect, you don't have the higher order components. Yes, and you can, exactly. do, you can do a deterministic preparation of single photons. You don't need the projective measurement so much. Right. That you are, you are adding something. You are basically uh, you, you are getting rid of one of the main problems with the ensemble of atoms, which is this the contribution of many independent processes that you have to, to deal with. Yes, I agree. I agree. I agree completely. Okay, so let's see if not yet. Maybe the the other questions. The other question, Daniel, is about the the, the last part that you were talking about. Um, where you were showing that, uh, can you go to the last slide, maybe to the latest experiment? Here. Here and the previous one. Yeah, the, actually the previous experiment, I think. Yeah, this one. So you, here you were saying that if you were, if you model the experiment by a classical model, the result of the G2 would be the same, right? Yes. But what happened? So my, my question is, uh, what? What would happen if you consider higher order correlations instead of G2? I don't know, you had G4 or, or other. Would, be, would it be it, the same or? Yes, it would be the same. So it, the thing is that when you talk about a thermal state, you are talking about a particular distribution of these higher order components. And what you have is really the thermal statistics. So if you go to four photons, uh, you can you three photons. You you have the what's expected for a thermostate. We we did that. We checked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. We just believed because we measure it. It, it didn't enter in this in this article actually, but uh, but we did that. It, it, it's nice, but it's if you if you if you see this that the, you follow right the G two the G three and G four is expected. I see. But, it's the interesting thing that it, when you do memory, because many times the G2 measurements doing in a very short time scale. So you, you don't, you are not able to separate the delay by a lot. For example, when you do a parametric down conversion, for example, that you have a wave pack of femtoseconds, you have correlation times of femtoseconds. Now we have correlation times of microseconds. Okay. And then you can actually correlate Throughout this whole time, the, the detection, the detector uh, reacts with, uh, I mean, our electronics, we are able to distinguish process separate by 100 picoseconds. Okay. Basically, what, what I'm saying is that we can do, I mean, G2, G3, G4, G5, because we can even using two detectors, because we can correlate different times. <laughs> you see, it, we have a really, you can do a lot of, uh, of the statistics or our check of this the overall state but we we never found anything different from thermal statistics i see and so the idea would would in the, the next work the most recent one would be yeah. to to probe the system with two different uh well, right the, this this idea actually uh it was introduced in 2007 by a group in the united states that point out theoretically that you should have this violation and but they, they couldn't they couldn't observe it experimentally they did the experiments but they couldn't reach the quantum region 
But in our system, it, we, we are already dealing with the DLCZ quantum correlations. To observe the DLCZ quantum correlation, we need to take care of many issues in the system. And then when we moved to this experiment, it was very natural to, to observe this violation, actually. But it, it's, it's hard to see because the violation is not very large. Okay? And you can lose it really easily. But for, for me, it's, it's interesting that it survives over the classical background. That's what I find interesting. But you need to see that this, this correlation, the G2, this correlated G2 is around 2.5, right? between 2.5 and 3. That's close to the maximum that's theoretically predicted. And if you go to that previous uh, system that I showed you, the DLCZ, the pair of photons in the DLCZ protocol, you can get this correlation function to go to 600. <laughs> wow. I thought that's the difference. But I, for me, I mean, it's really impressive that you, you, but you can do, you can see this non-classicality without filters. I would say that's uh, what's impressive. When you do that, what, what actually we call attention is that it's not limited by power, no? because typically, if you have this quantum correlation, sometimes you go to low, lower power, you get more correlation because you suppress this classical noise. But this, this correlation that you observe over the classical noise is not as dependent. We could increase the power as much as we could and we, we, we were still seeing it. We actually stopped because the, 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 the detectors were saturated. <laughs> but... <laughs> I see. But uh, here, Daniel, is there a, you, you mentioned that there could be a theoretical maximum for this system, right? You said, yeah. or, or actually, there is a theoretical what? maximum predicted in two thousand seven, but these experiments are already larger than that. <laughs> so okay. we already are, are are pointing out some open theoretical problems here. It's a little bit. It's it should be. This violation, I think it, it's, for example, the, the two, I think it's 2.6, the maximum for the correlation function. It's not, it's not, it's B is 1.8. No, it's a we are a little bit above here, but significant. It's not, uh, okay. Uh, I don't have the, the, the picture here because in the article we put the, the threshold for the, the theory that's here, it's clear to see, but we should have a line around here. And we are above it. Just saying I that see. we are above. I mean, the theoretical from the theoretical value, but not by much. Not a factor of ten. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. So, guys, uh, questions? I don't see any question. Uh, I, I have a question. Sandra has a question. <laughs> yes, Please, about the first part, super radiance. And when I say that uh, we observe, uh, I emitted one, the, the collection of atoms can emit one photon. Okay. My question then is, I can say um, that uh, one photon can, in, can be absorbed by a collection of atoms and how I can observe this and uh, uh, Actually, understand this. I think the best way to understand it, I mean, not to understand it, but at least to realize what we don't understand <laughs> is that this, this problem has a complete analogy of a multiple slit experiment. Okay. Mm. And then if you get light and then to pass through a multiple slit, mm. you eventually will see an interference fringe in the end. But only if you don't know through which slit your excitation passed through. That's the same thing here. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. see the super radiance if you don't know through which atom the excitation passed through. So mm -hmm. super radiance in some ways is actually a completely wave phenomenon. Okay, it's a constructive interference. What, what gets interesting here is that we also measure the statistic of light. Then we have mm -hmm. this constructive interference, but we just have one particle. <laughs> but but that, that's exactly the same uh, paradox of multiple mm -hmm. slits. Mm -hmm. And the, if you uh, ex then you cannot do the parallel that to say I excite the, a collection of atoms. You cannot do this parallel. No, the, the thing is that if I don't measure the statistics of the light, 
saying that I have just one photon and then one atom mm -hmm. was excited only, then you can always... You don't know which one, collection. but you... Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do this kind of measurement, if you, don't, if you just measure super radiance, it's like mm -hmm. you're you are measuring a, a quantum mechanical phenomenon, but just the wave, wave nature of it. Mm -hmm. And then you can explain through polarization. Mm -hmm. You can say mm -hmm. that you, you, just, uh, you excite just a small portion of the ensemble. Mm. What gets tricky is when you measure the statistics, and then you see that there was just one. That's the, that's the point. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's really the, the, the way to describe the process is quite different when you do it quantum mechanically. Because when you, you write down the equations, you actually don't have a coherence in any single atom. You have mm. this collective state in which you, you have one app that was transferred. So you just have population mm -hmm. in one atom. You don't have coherence. You, the coherence is purely collective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think that uh, we don't have at the moment other questions. So just remember that the video is, of course, uh, available online. And of course, you can still uh, uh, continue to, to visit the, the website of uh, the S SBF at any moment. So with this, I would like to thank uh, Daniel for, uh, oh, thank you. Thank uh, you for the, the very invitation. nice talk and the discussion. And we will come back in September with the next talk of this series. And uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, watching this seminar and participating. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you, Tommaso. Bye-bye. <laughs>